Kia ora, good evening. Labour inspectors began nationwide visits to dairy farms this week to ensure those who employ workers are following labour laws. Individuals and corporates can face maximum fines of $10,000 and $20,000 respectively for breaking employment laws. Particular focus is being paid to seasonal averaging of salaries and the failure to keep accurate time and wage records. Due to the nature of agricultural work, in particular dairying, hours can change dramatically depending on the season, which can result in workers not being paid minimum wage. Federated farmers say farmers must structure their business to meet the laws and that they, that may mean employing staff on hourly rates and rostering to keep track of hours. As we all know, cows need to be milked seven days a week and also there's the, the extra time involved in the springtime and in, into early summer where it was really dawn to dusk, or du dawn to dusk um, um, farm work but then in the winter time we have um, some really slack periods where um, you might be only working two or three hours a day. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's how you structure your, um, your salary to, to meet those demands. And as we know that, that sometimes the law doesn't really reflect what's happening on our farms and it's actually an issue. And I'm not saying that um, farmers can't get around the problem but it just makes it it's a bit quite difficult. So an example might be of a dairy worker who's earning forty or forty-five thousand a year. He's working um, eighty hours a week, some weeks, and then in the middle of winter he might be working ten hours a week. So his, his average hourly rate can be affected by that. That's correct. If if you've got a um, person on forty-five thousand during eighty hours um, one week in, in the spring, you're actually underpaying him. And but then in the winter time when he might be only doing ten hours or fifteen hours a week because the cows are away else grazing somewhere else, you're actually overpaying them. So I don't know how we get around this and it, and, um, it is a difficult um, issue for the, dairy, for the industry but how do, how do we solve that? One of the suggestions has been an hourly rate? Well that's, that's correct and, and if, if, if men or workers can work it out that when they get paid $80, 80 hours a week that they can save and put away some money for that for those months when they might be only working 10 hours a week. Um, and if, if that was the case, that's a great solution. But are they willing to do that and have the ability to do that? 2013 census quick stats have been released about Southland that show we live in the 11th biggest region of 16 in New Zealand but have just 2.2% of the country's population. 93,339 people live in Southland and there are 1,017 more females than males. There's been an 11.4% increase in Māori since the 2006 census and 1.9% of New Zealand's Māori population live in the region. Couples with children make up just under 40 40% of the all families, while over 45% of couples without children, 14% of families are one-parent families with children. The unemployment rate in the South is 4.7% for those 15 and over, compared with 7.1% of all of New Zealand, and the most common occupation group for the region is managers. From July, patients will have the opportunity to provide feedback and rate their experiences in hospital. District health boards will be running quarterly patient surveys to find out about their most recent stay in hospital. The 20 question survey covers issues like whether patients understood advice they were given by their doctor, whether they were involved with the decisions about care and treatment, and whether they were treated with dignity and respect by hospital staff. For the first time, collated data will be give each DHB a rating out of 10 in the areas of coordination, partnership, communication and physical and emotional needs. Results from the first survey will be published in October 2014. The consent to discharge treated wastewater into a river near Lake Tianao is set to expire and South and District Council are proposing a replacement option to disperse wastewater above ground through spray irrigation. Submissions are now closed and a consent hearing is scheduled in Tianao for the second week of June. I spoke to Ian Marshall of the South and District Council about the proposed replacement. The current consent allows us to discharge into the river which ultimately discharges into Lake Tianao and that idea of a direct discharge to the water body isn't an acceptable solution anymore. So we need an option that has some alternative to that where we're discharged to land. And that's what we're proposing to irrigate to land in the land area around the Tiano Airport. And it's a combination of, of irrigation and odour disbursement? 
Well, the odour comes from the fact that if there's a potential for anything to make odour, then you need a consent to discharge to the air for that. Now, we don't intend to create odour, and we will do things by way of treating the effluent to minimise that. You can actually detect the odour from the ponds at the current location. In fact, when I say detect, you virtually can't detect it because there is no odour. But the problem is we've got to pump it through a long pipeline to get to the Tianu Airport. And it's that length of time in the pipeline that may create some odour problems unless we do a bit of additional treatment at the pond in the first place. The area that you're looking at, how, how residentially built up is it there? Well, it's there aren't any close residences to there. The airport itself is the closest building. On the other side of the airport, there is a subdivision, though, which isn't well developed at this stage, but there will be residences in that area. But the, that's quite a long distance removed from the disposal field itself. What's the, um, the cost involved in, in this project? Well, the way it's designed conceptually at the moment, it's around $10 million. Um, and that's a considerable reduction from some of the earlier proposals that had been thought about uh, in the stages four and five years ago. This um, system that you're looking at, is it um, future-proofed for a population swell in the area, should that occur? Yes, it is. It's designed to accommodate roughly three times the sort of flows that are currently in the system, so it should handle predicted populations for the next um, 20, 30 years. Stay with us up after the break. Guest nights in Queenstown rocket and we find out why Meridian Energy and Southern District Council are heading to the High Court. Welcome back. Tourism Mecca Queenstown continues on its winning streak, hitting record guest nights in the first quarter of the year. Following on from its record guest nights last year, the trend is continuing with January, February and March this year all experiencing higher guest nights than the previous year. Statistics New Zealand's commercial accommodation monitor shows guest nights rose 5.2% this March compared to last, with the average length of stay also increasing. International guest nights rose 7.3%, while domestic stays were also up 1.2%. For the year ending March, guest nights rose 9% on the last year to just over 2,837,000 for the 12-month period. Meridian Energy and Southern District Council are working together to seek clarification on how legislation on the Manapori Power Scheme works with the Southern District Plan. It'll be up to the High Court to decide how Meridian and the Council work together on activities relating to the 50-year-old Manapori Tianao Development Act. Essentially what we're seeking to establish is the interrelationship between those two pieces of legislation. In other words, um, does the Manapori Tiana Development Act take precedence or does the Resource Management Act take precedence? And how that relates at a local level is, for instance, if Meridian want to do some work on the West Arm Power Scheme, say they want to establish some new facilities or infrastructure over there, do they need resource consent from us or don't they? And that's been a bit of an ongoing dialogue that we've been having with them over a number of years. We have a good collaborative, positive working relationship with Meridian, so it's not an argument as such, but it's really something that just needs to be clarified. Has there been some work uh, suggested that has, has prompted this to get this clarification? Yeah, well they had a minor project which was really just adding a ventilator shaft to the uh, West Down Power uh, House and that sort of prompted the issue was do, does it need consent or doesn't it? But it's really a matter of clarifying it for anything that they may want to uh, do in the future um, so that both organisations know whether they, where they stand, whether they need a resource consent or they don't. So it takes the High Court to determine this? Yes it does really. It's really a point of law so it's not something that the Environment Court would um, consider because it's not a, prompted by a particular uh, appeal against a resource consent or anything like that. It's really a legal issue about how the two pieces of uh, statute interrelate. What, what sort of cost is involved in, in getting to the bottom of this? Yeah, there will be some costs and I can't give you an exact figure on that. Um, we've made an uh, agreement with Meridian that the costs will lie where they fall, so they'll fund their side of it and we'll fund their side of it. And we've got our heads together on sort of agreeing some facts to try and minimise the points at dispute, if you like. So hopefully that'll also keep the costs down to both parties and particularly to our ratepayers. So we're trying to clarify this issue uh, at minimum cost. And, uh, and a time frame for this, Bruce? 
Yeah, we're really at the whim of the High Court around that. Um, I'd say it would be a minimum of about three months. We're hoping within six months we can have a decision. And that's quite important to us because we're going through our district plan review at the moment, reviewing our district plan, which is effectively our environmental rule book, if you like. So we're hopeful that by the time we get to the stage of issuing decisions around that, we'll also have this High Court clarification so the new document can be consistent with that. So when this new documentation does come through and, and works for both parties, what will it enable both parties to do? Is it going to have any major effect on the way it operates now? Yeah, it could have some reasonably significant implications because, for instance, if the High Court um, agreed with Meridian's stance that the Manapuri Tiana Development Act takes precedence, then that would effectively mean that anything related to the Manapuri power scheme, either now or in the future, could proceed without needing a resource consent. So I guess you could say that that sort of takes some of the public component out of that process. Um, but I'm not going to prejudge what the outcome will be at this stage. But that's really what we both, both agencies need that clarified, really. Southland recorded the largest fall in April house sales compared to March with an almost 30% drop in volumes. Property sales in Southland fell by 28.7% in April compared to March, but the added complication of Easter and school holidays may have been a contributing factor, according to Helen O'Sullivan of the Real Estate Institute of New Zealand. She says April was generally a softer month for sales than March, but the decline was significant, with sales volumes retreating to 2012 levels. Sales of homes under 400,000 fell more than the overall market, suggesting the LVR restrictions are having an impact. Homes in Canterbury were the fastest to sell, with a median listing time of 28 days, closely followed by Auckland. Sport is along next after the weather. From the news team, it's goodnight.